We had a lot, of, a lot of fun, and I do have some big news uh, for you this morning uh, that my wife and I uh, officially started a garden, all right? And y'all thought that was going a different direction, and, uh, <laughs> and, and by garden, I mean that we have a few green plants that we're trying to keep alive in the name of Jesus, and, uh, and it's been a lot of fun, and I am what you would call an extremist. If you know me, I'm either all in or I'm out, baby. So if I like start doing something, I go all in, all right? Anybody else like that? You just want to go all out. And so what started with a lettuce plant, now I have like 10 varieties of peppers, and uh, I got grow lights and hydroponic systems, and our neighbors think we're growing weed in the house. We're not. And uh, it, you, they can see in the window, I'm like, this looks really bad to the public eye, but we'll, we'll feed you, grow, we'll get you groceries, all right? Um, I was at Home Depot um, recently, because I didn't know that you're supposed to order seed online, but I was at Home Depot, and, and on the little packets, y'all have seen the packets, you know, and it's on the, on the shelf, and it'll tell you this is the plant type, and It'll tell you this, this is the proper conditions that you want it to grow in, whether it's shade or partial sun or full sun. And uh, basically, I'm a professional now, um, if you didn't know. And it'll tell the ideal temperature. And, and then this interesting phrase at the bottom of the packets really caught my attention. And it says, how many days till harvest, right? And, and I, I was very caught up with this because some of them was like 100 days and like 80 days and like 95 days. And I'm like, no, no, no. Like, I'm impatient. Anybody else impatient? I want to plant something and see fruit immediately. And so I started doing some research. What stuff grows the fastest? If you Google that, you'll see all kinds of stuff. So uh, clarify, what vegetable grows the, the fastest? And, uh, and I was so discouraged because I was like, I'm going to have to wait on this stuff to grow. Right? It seems pretty logical and simple. Um, but, but I started doing some research. I learned that radishes can grow in like 30 days. Pretty, pretty simple. And, and then I, did, I found this YouTube video on this lady growing microgreens. Have you all ever heard of microgreens? Basically, you can take a seed, you can overseed in a, in a small little area, and you can water it. And within 7 to 10 days, which is my kind of growing vegetables, all right, you can see a harvest and you can eat of its fruit and, or of its leaves because there's no fruit. And, uh, and, and I tell you this now because basically you need to know that I'm a homesteader and um, that I, we're, we're, we're going all in, okay? Like we're going to have a TV show about gardening and I'm going to put the pastoring thing aside for a little bit and uh, I'm kidding. I'm, I, I'm, I'm telling you this. I want you to write this down. How many days till harvest? That's the direction we're going to run uh, for the next several weeks as we approach the summer and the fall, because I believe what God is doing in this church is very unique, and I want us to take full advantage of the season we're in. Tell, tell the person next to you, say, you need to get your straw hat on today. Get, you, get your farming hat. I need one of those, by the way. I'm going to find me one. Kendra's going to hate it. I, I want to take a look at Galatians chapter 6. If you've got a Bible, um, It'll be on the screens as well, Galatians chapter 6, and as we get ready to do that, you need to understand why Paul is writing to uh, the the Galatian church, and this church that he is writing to had been infiltrated with false teachers, which there's still false teachers today on earth, but he's writing to a specific group of people that had started following a teaching that was not sound doctrine, it was not biblical, and what these people were teaching the, the church in Galatia was that they had to be circumcised or recircumcised to inherit the kingdom of God. Now, I just want to tell you, that's not the best technique to grow a church, all right? I accidentally said that several months ago, and all of you were like, what is going on? I accidentally said that we needed to be circumcised again, and it was very embarrassing, and please forgive me. I'm still being uh, talked about about that. So um, Paul is being pretty aggressive in the book of Galatians, and and he's wanting them to understand just how foolish this seems that you would would recircumcise or circumcise to follow Jesus. And today we're going to land right in the middle of chapter 6, and we're going to revisit a very important spiritual principle and spiritual law. Galatians 6 verse 7, it says, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. And whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh they will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, 
from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people. Everybody say all people. Especially, puts an emphasis on the ones who are part of the family of believers. Now, I want to pause here and let you know the world exists with fixed physical laws that are in place by God for God. These are absolute. These are immovable. They're not changing. They're not random. They're not accident. And they are not happenstance. What I mean by that is the rising and the setting of the sun. It is not an accident that it happens this way. Uh, The turning of the axis and the effect that it has on all of the ocean, it is not an accident or a, a happenstance that it happens this way. The fact that you can throw something in the air and it returns back to the ground, which is called what? Gravity. It is not an accident. All of this stuff is in place for a reason. You breathe in oxygen, you breathe out carbon dioxide. And and the physical universe, it has laws and principles that are in place that are trustworthy. Would you all agree? Now, God has set these into place to guide us and protect us. And just as much as there are physical laws, there are spiritual laws. And we're going to unpack one of those today. Um, God set it all up this way. And I want to say this, that there is a little bit of predictability about God. Like, would you agree God is a man of his word? You can read his word and you know what he's capable of doing. You can look at the past and you can kind of tell about the future. God is a man of his word. So there's a little bit of predictability. But also, if you have followed the Lord at any amount of time in your life, you know that there's some unpredictability, right? Because God does exceedingly and abundantly more than, he could, than we could ask, think, or imagine. So that means if I ask, then he can do more. He can exceed the expectation. He does abundantly more. So he's predictable, yet he's a little bit unpredictable in his nature. And he's a good father. There are physical laws and there are spiritual laws that have been set into place. And, and we are to trust them and they help guide our life. I want to I say this because some of you, you need, to, you need to understand that these cross over into each other. Like if you woke up tomorrow morning, all right, and you decided, well, you know what? I just don't like the, I don't like gravity. I am not a fan of gravity anymore. Gravity is not real. By the way, this is what the world we live in. This is how crazy the world is that we are. I, gravity is not real. And my truth is my truth. And so gravity, I'm done with you. I'm done with you. And so you walk to the top of a staircase (laughs) at the University of Arkansas. And you, you stand at the top of the stairs and you turn your back to the stairs and you say, today, gravity, I'm gonna show you who's in charge. And you do, you do what we used to call trust falls. Y'all ever do trust falls back in the day? It's like trust fall, and you fall on people, and they aren't supposed to catch you. And you fall all the way down to that bottom step, and you immediately regret your decisions, right? It is so silly that we would trust our opinions and our ideas about truth rather than truth itself. This is their physical and spiritual laws. What goes up must come down. The spiritual law of sowing and reaping is just as simple and complex as gravity. Not trusting gravity is pretty silly, right? But this idea is how silly we look in our life when we sow one thing and then we expect to reap something different. Like, I'm going to plant a carrot, but I want some lettuce. Y'all see how silly this sounds? I'm going to plant some cotton, and I'm going to be really upset when I don't have an apple tree. We would call that person a lunatic, but we do this in our life. So hypothetically, if you don't like gravity, I say this with all the love in my heart, gravity doesn't care if you like it or not. It just is how it is. Like that's how my my teachers, this is just how it is, Seth. And it's the same thing with sowing and reaping because our opinion does not override the truth, nor does our opinion override physical and spiritual laws that have been put in place by the God of the universe. And so there's physical laws and there's spiritual laws. And then there's also man-made laws. These are the speed limit signs none of you like. These are road signs maybe you ignore, right? The roundabouts that get put in that everybody curses at and then you ask for forgiveness as you leave them. And I read last night that in Arkansas, it is illegal 
to yell at your children in a drive through restaurant. But as soon as you leave, you, Lord, have your way. You know, like, <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is, we're not talking about man-made things. This is God's order that he has set up, physical and spiritual law. So in Galatians chapter 6, Paul is literally telling this church that if you want to radically change your life, you need to pay attention to this. He's like, he's like clapping, hey, please, please don't miss this. What you plant, you will see come to life. What you sow, you will reap. It's the law of sowing and reaping, meaning whatever you sow, you will reap. It's cause and effect. It's the relationship between an action and an event, meaning when an action occurs, then we see this event take place. If you are like me, in any capacity, you've probably asked the question, why am I going through this, right? Why is this happening to me? And we don't always have reasons or explanations for the things that we walk through, but some of the things in my life have been self-inflicted, meaning that I planted something in one season and I saw the fruit of it in the next and was asking God why it happened. Well, you planted the seed. And I, and I had to relearn all of this recently. Verse 7 says, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. Write this down. Do, do not be deceived. In a world where deception is so easy today, Paul, what Paul is getting at is that many people believe that they are the exception to the law. Y'all ever met somebody like this? They think that they are exempt. They are the exception. They are the gift to the universe. <laughs> Everybody loves being around those people, right? Paul is telling everyone present and everyone today that as we read this text that none of us are the exception to this law that he is about to present. Like, and maybe you're here and you're like, well, Seth, I hear you, but, but my life is meaningless and, and I'm just going to do my own thing and go my own way. And I'm just going to tell you and I'm going to encourage you with this because I've been here before. It is never too late to start sowing good seed. It is never too late to turn around, to repent, to start living for God, to get your life on track and see literal immediate fruit in your life. But my life, it was meaningless before. It was purposeless. It was fruitless. And honestly, it was worthless because I was deceived. And I thought I was the exception to this. Paul, it's almost like he clears his throat and he is making sure that this group of people knows that the enemy is a liar. And that he is the, he is the father of lies and his goal is deception. He wants to still kill and destroy every good thing that God has placed in your life and that God wants to place in your life. There are false teachers. There is sin running rampant. And what he is saying is there are still people that think they're exempt from what he's about to say. Paul is about to share a powerful moment with this church. In Romans 16, it says, I urge you, brothers and sisters, to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching that you've learned. Keep away from them, for such people are, they're not serving our Lord, but their own appetites. Make, make note of that. They're serving their own agenda, their own appetites, what they want in their flesh. By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the minds of naive people. 2 Corinthians 5, it says, For we must all appear... This is a very bold verse. Before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what they have done in the body, whether it is good. Y'all say good or evil. Y'all say evil. So whether you are sowing good seed or bad seed, hear me, there will be a crop in your life. We get to decide what that's going to look like. Paul is pleading with them. He's like, please, please don't be deceived. You've got to get this. Write this down. You reap what you sow. You reap what you sow. Anything that you, that you sow, you, you will reap. And he, he goes on into verse 7. He says, a man reaps what he sows. I joked about it earlier, but you don't get tomatoes by planting lettuce. You don't get cotton by planting beans. And the harvest is always a reflection of the sowing that takes place. It, it always reflects. You can't sow something and expect something else. I love that God made this principle so simple. Are you all with me? 
It's so simple, it's so practical, yet as humans, we have complicated it. You plant something in your life, it takes root in your life, and then it produces fruit in your life. And if you don't like the fruit that is being produced in your life, reevaluate the seed that is being sown. Because we, are, we, we all know what it's like, right? To want one thing. Oh, y'all don't be acting brand new in church. Like y'all, everybody's been here, right? You want this thing, but then we plant this other thing. Anybody been there? Like I want this so bad, but I plant this thing over here. Like our New Year's resolution, I'm going to be fit, F-I-T. And in one week, I changed one letter and I said, and this year I'm going to be fat, okay? Like, because it's hard, because I want this thing, but I keep doing this thing. Paul writes about it through, through the New Testament. I want this, but I keep doing this. Like, I, my, my flesh, it's like it's so hungry, right? I'm guilty of this. Back in college, I remember desiring so bad to have a healthy relationship. I wanted a healthy marriage. I wanted to see and have healthy kids. And, and I wanted this, this family. But what I wanted and what I was doing was two different things. Because what I wanted was a God-honoring marriage, but I was still addicted to pornography. What I wanted was a God-honoring marriage, but I was still struggling with lust everywhere I went. I wanted good friendships, but I had trust issues and I couldn't trust anybody. I wanted to stop chewing tobacco. I chewed tobacco for seven years. I could smell it. and It'll just put chills on my arms. I wanted so bad to stop, and I knew if I was going to win that Kendra, Kendra, oh, Lord, help me. I need help. I got to stop. But I can't stop chewing if I keep going to come and go and buying a bag of tobacco. Are y'all tracking with me? I can't plant one thing and then expect something else to grow. I wanted healthy finances, but I kept buying things that I didn't need to impress people I didn't even like. I wanted to stop cussing, but all I listened to was garbage. You, can't, you cannot expect to bear fruit in this field if all you're doing is planting in the flesh. This weekend was Zane's birthday. Uh, we had a party, and there were a lot of sweets in our home. And uh, I'm just telling you, Lord, I'm sorry. Like, I, I got home last night. I was a little stressed out. It was late. Y'all know the feeling. When you walk in the kitchen, nothing looks appealing. And, and, and sure enough, there's a box of donuts left over. I ate three cake donuts. I cut a piece, of, a piece of cake that was so big, it, I, I'm shameful of it today. And I didn't even use a fork. I was a barbarian. It's like we didn't have any forks in the house. I'm eating it with my bare hands like I've never seen food before. That was last night. God forgive me. <laughs> but I can't have the summer bod if I'm eating all the cake. And Are y'all tracking with me today? So listen, if you want blessing in your life, stop planting selfishness. If you want love, stop being so angry. If you want love, stop the lust. You can't lust after everything you see. If you want peace, then stop worrying. If you want joy, then you, you got to stop being negative about everything. There are some people that can walk into a perfect room and find 20 things that's wrong with it. We got, we got to be careful about what we plant. We can't expect grace and then judge everybody else. We can't want friends and then gossip about them behind their back. I, I want to be blessed, but listen, if we want to be blessed, we, we want a harvest of, of God's goodness, but, but so often we plant the opposite seed. We plant one thing and we expect another. That's what we call insane. It's, and I'll say it this way. Wishful thinking does not change what you've planted in your life. It doesn't, but God's grace can give you a fresh start. That's the beautiful thing. God can give you a fresh start, but he gives us a responsibility. I want to ask you a few questions today. What are you sowing? What are you sowing? Where are you sowing? Because we're going to talk about that. And what kind of harvest would you like to see? Because we know insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting what? A different result. Some of us need to try planting something different this year. Maybe you're here today and you feel the Lord tugging on you to get planted into the house of God. I double dog dare you, you will see blessing and fruit in your life. 
I reached out to a buddy of mine who I've met recently. His name is Luke. I believe he's here today. And I'm going to quote him. He sa- I said, hey, he's, he is a, he's brilliant when it comes to all things agriculture, and, and he would be ashamed of seeing what I've done with all of my plants. Sorry, Luke. And uh, I, I texted him. I said, hey, man, you're, you're a great farmer. Like, w- what wisdom would you? Y'all, listen to what he sent me. A good farmer always plants more seeds than he needs with the understanding that a good portion will not make it to maturity. A good farmer knows when the conditions are right for planting the moisture, the temperature, the weather forecast, but the seeds themselves must be healthy to have the ability to emerge from the soil. After the seed emerges from the soil, this is just the beginning. The harder task is ahead, caring for and protecting the crop until it reaches full maturity. This next part is crazy. A farmer is way more of a steward than he is a creator because any farmer knows that he did not make the crop. He did not make the seeds. He did not make the sunshine. He does not make the rain. But without the farmer, there could be no crop. Someone must plant the seed, cultivate the soil, protect and feed the growing plant, until, and then harvest the crop. When it's time for harvest, there is no time to wait. Some of y'all need to write that down. There's no time to wait because if you harvest too late, the crop will spoil and the birds will carry it away. It is a great collaboration between man and nature in which man is utterly dependent upon the provision of nature in the ground, but nature alone does not grow crops for man. What a great partnership. What a great collaboration between God and man. What a great amount of trust that the Lord would trust man and woman to be good stewards in the earth. I was like, bro, that's going to preach on Sunday. Isn't that good? God has partnered with humanity, you and me, to bring heaven to earth by sowing and reaping. My question this morning is, what are you sowing? And what do you, what do you want to reap in your life and do those things match each other? Because you can't plant one thing and expect something different. On the seed packets I found at the store, they had a specific planting location where you need to plant. You need to know this. There's two places you can plant in your life. You can plant in the flesh or you can plant in the spirit. God, he really simplifies this, and Paul's trying to teach this church. Verse 8, it says, whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh they will reap destruction. He's not pulling any punches. Whoever sows to please the spirit, whoever sows to please God, from the spirit will reap eternal life. So it's very simple. If I sow in the flesh, I'm going to reap destruction. If I sow in the spirit, then I'm going to reap eternal life. This seems like a no-brainer, right? It seems like a pretty easy decision to make, but we, we make things so complicated. So field number one is the flesh. Everybody say the flesh. We've all got one, and you need to know this. When you got saved, your flesh did not get saved. Your flesh is the flesh. Stay with me. Your flesh wants what it wants. But when you get saved, your flesh goes in the back seat, and he ain't driving the car no more. Your flesh wants what it wants, and it'll eat anything in sight. After driven by desire, our sin nature in our flesh, which is independent of God, it's where I want something for me, even though God doesn't want it for me. This is the flesh. It's having a strong desire for anything that opposes the will of God. The Bible calls this sin nature. It's to be fully independent from God, expressing that through our flesh and our sinful desires. Paul writes, I know what I should do, but I don't do it. We'll read that verse here in a second. So when you sow in the flesh, it brings corruption, destruction, and death. That sounds really encouraging, right? He's laying it out. If you sow here, this is what happens. But if you sow here, this is what happens as well. It reminds me of the movie we used to watch growing up called Tremors. Anybody ever watch Tremors? These big giant worm snake graboid things that would go through this town, through the ground. And they would eat anything in their sight. And the only way to kill them is like loud noises. They would open up their mouth and they would throw dynamite into their mouth. And these things would go underground and they would explode. They would eat anything in their path. This is how our flesh works. This is how sin nature works. I'll do anything just to satisfy the lust of my flesh 
And I just want to be, be very straightforward with you today. Be very careful about what you consume. Be very mindful about what you plant in your life. Listen, there are some things that you don't need to be sowing into your life. And I'll say it this way. There's some things you don't need to sow into the lives of other people as well. It's, it's corruption and it's, it's decay. One, one theologian said, this is like your life. It's a picture of your life. It's like the smell of milk that has become sour. Anybody want that? <laughs> it's like moldy bread. It's the decaying and the tearing down, the ruining of life. James 1 15, it says, and then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's full grown, it gives birth to what? To, to death. I'll tell you this, no one wakes up one day just saying, I can't wait to have a miserable life. I can't wait to be neck deep in sin, just waiting to die and just living for the moment. No, desire conceives and then it turns into sin and sin gives birth to death. That, that's how we get to a place where we're so lost and we don't know how to be found. There's good news coming. Uh, my roommates in college, they broke the golden rule of being a roommate. Do y'all know what it is? It's eating my food, all right? If you've had roommates and you've ever had your food get eaten and then nobody wants to fess up to it, y'all know what I'm talking about? They would do this, and I remember it'd be like 6 p.m., dinner time, going into the kitchen, and I look, and there's, there's nothing looks appealing, and I go away, y'all, y'all done this, I know you have. You go back to that same fridge like something's gonna magically appear, right? You open the fridge an hour later and you look into it, into a deep abyss, and you shut it because nothing looks appealing, right? And you make the trip three or four more times and midnight rolls around and that's where all bad decisions are made. Those donuts last night. And I go to that fridge, this happened so many times in college, and, and I open the fridge, I grab pickles, mayonnaise, lettuce, and, and, and some other weird stuff, jalapeno, anything that looked good, and then and all the bread that was left in the, in the cabinet was just the end pieces. We call it the butt, right? The butt of the bread. And I get those two little ugly pieces of bread, and I make the dumbest sandwich possible. And you want to know, I ate that sandwich. Why did I eat that sandwich? Because what did not look appealing to me, when I kept going back to it, every time I returned to that fridge, that that looked like it wouldn't satisfy, I start convincing myself, that's probably going to fill me up. This is how silly it looks in our life when we go back to the thing that we said we'll never go back to. When we go back to the thing and, and, and maybe you've never pursued Jesus and this is your day to say yes to him. And he's saying, I have an abundant, I got a big old Subway sandwich for you. You don't have to eat the slop of the pigs. But I go and I make this sandwich because it looks appealing now. Because my flesh, when it's hungry, if it is not starved and if it is not silenced and if my flesh is not put in its rightful place, it'll try to eat anything in sight. It'll try to consume anything that, that my body is willing to give it. So, so hear me, if we sow into field number one, which is the flesh, we know that we reap destruction. But the Bible says that if we sow in the spirit, we reap what? Eternal life. Is this really stark contrast. Field number two is the spirit. When we sow in the, the, the field of the Spirit, it produces abundant life, blessing, the favor of God, the fruit of the Spirit, eternal life. I want to ask you this. It's a very simple question. Do you want a decaying life or do you want abundant life? And it, and it seems so easy to answer in a church, but when we leave and we're tempted, it's, it's like, what do I do with this? It's so vital to ask yourself, which harvest do I prefer? There's two possible harvests. But what you plant in this season will determine what you eat in the next. This seems like a really easy question to answer. And and, and the thing is, is if you ask me, I'm going to answer. I want the big harvest. I don't want to sow in the first field. I want to sow in the second field. I want to sow in the spirit. I want to see fruit in my life. But so many times we have planted bad seeds and we are begging God for a good harvest. Are y'all tracking with me? So many times we put ourselves in places of personal weakness and then we expect the presence of God to bail us out. God's word, it says that you reap what you sow. I want to read this from Galatians 5 as we get ready to close. 
Galatians 5, 13 through 26, it says, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Everybody say this with me, love your neighbor as yourself. This is good seed. But it says, if you bite and devour each other, which is a really funny picture, Watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. This is bad seed. So I say, here's the alternative. Walk by the Spirit. Would you write that down? Walk by the Spirit. We're going to talk a lot about this in the coming weeks. Walk by the Spirit. Walk by the Spirit. And you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit. And the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. You need to know this. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. Listen, your flesh and your spirit are not besties for the resties. Your flesh and your spirit, they are not kicking it on the weekend, or at least they shouldn't be. The Bible says that your flesh and your spirit are contrary to each other. They are enemies of each other. That If you put them together, nothing good is going to happen. They attack each other. Paul understands this, and this is what Paul says in Romans. I read this and laugh every time. It says, I do not understand what I do. Y'all ever read this? For, for what I want to do, I do not do. But, but what I hate to do, I do it. This is my conversation with God after I sin. This is what it sounds like. And I do what I don't want to do, but then I don't do what I do want to do. I agree the law is good. And as it is, no longer I myself who do it, but it's the sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me. That is my sinful nature. It's like a riddle. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I can't do it. I can't carry it out. For I do not do the good that I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. Are y'all seeing how back and forth this thing is? It's the flesh in the spirit. It's the flesh in the spirit. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it's sin living in me. Earlier it said that, so I walk by the spirit. And if you walk by the spirit, you will not gratify the desires of your flesh. Please, please make note of this. It does not say that you won't have desires. If you walk by the spirit, you won't gratify, meaning you won't give into those desires. Because just having the desire isn't necessarily the sin. It's giving into the desire that turns into sin. It's an event. It's an action that leads to an event. It's a seed that's sown that turns into fruit and a plant, and it comes to life. But what happens when you stop feeding the spirit, or you start feeding the spirit, and you stop gratifying the flesh? This is how you know when you're growing spiritually, by the way. If you're wondering today, like, I don't know if I'm growing any. I don't know if I'm making any steps closer to the Lord. Listen, we sing that song, I'm no, I'm no longer a slave to sin, but I am a child of God. You split the sea so I could walk right through it. Listen, God has put the Holy Spirit inside of you when you say yes to him so that you can say no to sin. So that you have the power and the authority to walk this life that he's called you to walk. This is how you know you're growing. When you stop giving in to the desires and you put that flesh in the back seat and say, you are no longer in charge here. Y'all ever had a back seat driver? That, that flesh ain't driving the car no more. It's the spirit. You are no longer feeding every desire that pops up in your flesh because you are growing and your spirit is too. The spirit of God, it lives inside of you and you can overcome it. Jesus, he, li- he talks about it all through the Bible all through the New Testament, that he's not going to let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. So what is he saying? If you walk by the Spirit, you no longer have to gratify the desires of your flesh because you reap what you sow. There is a very, very big contrast, and I I want to say this before, before we pray. Paul says walk in the Spirit so that you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. He does not say stop sinning so you can walk in the Spirit. Please hear me on this, okay? There's a very important order that takes place. Paul says, walk in the Spirit so that you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Paul does not say, stop sinning so that you can walk in the Spirit. This is huge. It's not stop sinning 
and then walk by the Spirit. This is what it is. It's walk by the Spirit, therefore you will stop feeding your flesh. Are y'all tracking with me this morning? Once you start feeding your spirit, man, your flesh starts getting starved. And its appetite will start. You silence your flesh. It doesn't mean that the flesh disappears. It just means it's not in charge anymore. You don't fix the flesh by working on the flesh. You you walk in the spirit and it puts that flesh in its rightful place, which is not in charge. And so it's simple as this. If you want a new life, which is a great name for a church. If you want a new life, then walk by the spirit. Don't satisfy the, the, the cravings and the desires of your, of your flesh. If you would stand across the room, it's a very simple message today. We're about to worship some more. Paul continues in Galatians 6, and he says, Let us not grow weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people. Y'all say all people. Look at the person next to you say all people. Turn to the other person and say, he's talking to you too, okay? We, we, we don't get to choose who we love and who we don't. He's saying do good to all people, but especially the ones who are the family of believers. I want to say this with, with a lot of just boldness. Do not give up serving God. I believe this very, very strongly today. Some of you are here and you have been doing good, and you've been trying, you've been working hard, you've been trying to do all the stuff, and you haven't seen fruit yet, don't give up. Don't grow weary in doing good. Why? Because at the proper time, you will reap a harvest if you do not give up. Don't give up doing good. Don't grow weary. Everybody say, it's worth it. It is so worth it to follow Jesus. In in God's timing, you will reap a harvest if you do not give up. But this is what I know from my short little amount of time of following Jesus is there is a time between when you plant something and when you see the fruit of it. I call it the gap. And I want to encourage you as we approach the summer and we get ready to start, man, I believe God is about to do some incredible stuff in this church. He's already begun. But listen, can we be good stewards of the gap? Can we be good stewards of that gap between when we plant something and when we see the fruit come to pass? It's a very simple message today. Don't grow weary in doing good. Keep on pursuing Christ. If you would close your eyes, I wanna pray for you that God would just fill you with some boldness and with some courage, that he would light a fire in you today. God, we thank you for your word, that it changes us, that it sharpens us. And God, I pray today that every person in this room can identify if they're planting in the spirit or if they are planting in the flesh. It's very simple. It says, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. You will reap what you sow. It says, don't grow weary in doing good for at the proper time, you will reap a harvest if you do not give up. And so God, we don't want to give up. Would you give us the ability to press on through the power of your Holy Spirit? And God, if there's anybody here today that is planting the wrong things in the wrong field, would you help them turn to you today? The word repent, it is to turn from our sin and to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. Would you give us the ability to do that? I believe people are turning right now. God, your grace gives us a new field to plant in. And my prayer is as a church, we would plant good seed and that we would see good things come to pass. We thank you, Jesus, for what you're doing through this church. We know that it's only the beginning and we ask that you would lift our head to see where our help comes from because we need your help. We invite you into this place. Continue to speak to us this morning as we worship. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. Let's worship together.